asthma education is delivered in a variety of settings and should be tailored to each individual with asthma. Today's webinar will raise awareness of the value of asthma home visits and the impact that they have on improving the quality of life for people who live with asthma. My name is Sally Schessler and I'm Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network. Allergy and Asthma Network is a grassroots organization that has been making a difference in the allergy and asthma space for over 35 years. Our mission, as you can see on the next slide, is to end the needless death and suffering due to allergies, asthma, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. Are we able to advance the slides? There we go. There's our mission, and then we can move on. I'd like to introduce today's speakers to you. Andrea Jensen is a certified asthma educator and has been coordinator of the asthma program at Utah County Health Department since 2009. She is currently managing their asthma home visit program and providing virtual visits during the pandemic. Andrea is past chair of the Utah Asthma Task Force, past president of the Utah chapter of the Society of Public Health Educators, past editorial board member of Allergy and Asthma Today, and is currently on the executive board for the Association of Asthma Educators. Andrea lives with allergies, food allergies, and asthma. And she raised three adult children with allergies, food allergies, and asthma. Asthma is her passion and also her career. Gail Higgins has been a registered nurse for 36 years, with 34 years specializing in pediatrics. She's been a pediatric nurse practitioner for the last past 19 years with a focus on asthma and other pulmonary diseases. Gail is certified, a certified asthma educator and has worked with community health workers for approximately 11 years now. They have become an important part of her caring for children and their families with asthma. She is employed by Education Plus Health, a nonprofit which runs school-based health centers in 12 schools in the city of Philadelphia. She is the clinical supervisor for the Room to Breathe program, which is currently serving two large hospital-based pediatric primary care programs with a third coming online next month. Andrea and Gail, you are two busy ladies and we really look forward to having you with us today and have a great discussion on asthma home visits. Thank you. So welcome everybody, this is Gail talking. Um, asthma, as you can see on this slide, really affects a lot of people and a lot of kids. So about 25 million Americans are diagnosed with asthma and that takes down in terms of what I think of it as one in 10 children. The costs now are over $80 billion a year. That includes hospitalizations, medications, missed work days. And unfortunately, people are still dying from asthma, which is why it's so important um, to learn about home visits for asthma so we can help improve this number and hopefully make it that nobody will die from asthma anymore. Um, the number of missed school days per year is about up to 14 million now. 14 million days of school is being missed a year and parents and adults who have asthma are missing over 14 million work days a year. So it's affecting all of us in one way or another. Um, another thing is 71% of patients with asthma misuse their inhalers and one in five cannot afford medications. And I've seen, unfortunately seen that personally. So the first thing we're gonna be bringing up is social determinants of health, which I'm really has come to the forefront with the pandemic that we've been going through the past two years. So disparities in asthma has been horrendous. And it, again, it's been brought to the forefront, which shows why we need help with dealing with our disparities in asthma. I'm not gonna read this whole slide, but you can see that African-American children or adults are much higher for emergency room visits and deaths. Hispanic children are also much higher. Families and adults in a low income also have issues. And our social determinants of health are economic stability, healthcare, neighborhood and the environment, education, and social social community context, all things that we need to deal with when we think of our families and patients we take care of. So imagine if you have no health insurance, have no family support, and are worried about money. 
What are you going to do? Who can you go to? Who can help? And add to those worries of having a child with asthma. Do they have their medication or their inhaler? Do they need to go to the emergency room? Why do they always get sick? Are they breathing okay? All of this. And if you're a parent, can I go to work? Can they go to school? All of these adds to the issues that families and adults are dealing with with asthma on a daily basis. So asthma visits today, um, very quickly, and I know I'm sure there's a lot of providers out there, you know, they get their vital signs taken, they meet with a healthcare provider, they get their asthma assessment, refills if needed, hopefully a written asthma action plan will be given. Then they're done, they're sent to schedule their follow-up appointment with their healthcare provider, and that lasts approximately 15 minutes. So where, where does education come in? And what we see, what we as providers see in here, we see a healthy looking child. When you ask the parent how, or guardian, how's everything at home? Oh, it's fine, it's fine. He takes his medicine every day. Oh, does anybody smoke at home? No, no, but the kid's looking at you like, mm-hmm. Is your child coughing at night? Oh yes, he coughs every night. And how often is he using his albuterol inhaler? Oh, he uses it every day. And is he using a spacer? Huh, what's that? A spacer, I don't know what that is. I mean, that tells us that something's not right here. You know, we're not getting the whole picture of what's going on. So our limits as a healthcare provider are, we have time limits on visits. RVUs now, the bottom line is money, you know, so a healthcare provider needs to see so many patients a day, you're time limited. Now with the pandemic, COVID has limited staff in the office. You may not have your full staff that you used to have. And as a healthcare provider, we don't get the time to provide education. If we have a 15 minute visit with that child or that parent or that adult, that's it. We can't do anything else but the basics of what we have to do. So we're very limited. So what's missing in this, in this picture or in this visit? Time for education, time to review asthma triggers with the family or with the adult patient, time to ask what is really happening in the home and other issues that may be affecting the family in caring for their asthma. So who can do that? You can see on the one side, you've got your team members. So you've got your healthcare provider, the office nurse, the medical assistant, social work. If you have all of that in that office, not everybody does. But who can do that? Help with the education, help with finding out, finding out what's going on in the home, doing resources and stuff. That's where our community health workers and our health educators can step in and help out the healthcare provider and the families. So an ideal visit, help the family. This would what, what we as healthcare providers would ideally like to see is be able to help the family with the other issues that can impede caring for the child or the adult with asthma. We wanna empower the family or the adult through education. We wanna make sure education, asthma education is reinforced at each visit. And we wanna also support the patient emotionally and physically. We can't do that in 15 minutes and cover all four of those, you know, ab objects or not objects, but you know what I mean. So what an ideal visit takes is we want to be able to listen to the family. We want to treat them as equals. You know, they're coming in to see us. Lots of times they're afraid of us or, you know, they don't trust us. You want to take your time with the child or the adult and their family. We want to provide educational materials in their first language. They may be speaking English and have a good control of English, but is English their first language? It may not be. We want to praise them for a job well done in controlling their asthma or controlling their child's asthma, not missing school, not missing work, taking their medications. And we want to be able to address other issues, such as nutritional issues, social issues, or educational issues. These are all coming to the forefront because of the pandemic and the issues that are going on. 
So this is some food for thought. And to know, to think that this has been around for over a hundred years and why it's taken so long for this to be known is the connection between health and the dwelling of the population is one of the most important that exist. Florence Nightingale. So this was, she brought this up over a hundred years ago. And now within just the past 15 or so years, are we really starting to take this quote and say, okay, we need to do something to help these families and these adults who have asthma. So yes, people do still make house calls, but now we know physicians and healthcare providers will make house calls. That's coming back into style, but for families and adults with children and adults with asthma, we call them home visits. And who is going to be doing the home visit? We'll find out in a minute. So you've got the relationship between the provider and family. We have, of course, it's a professional relationship, but sometimes the parent is so focused on other issues that it's difficult to get them to focus on what you're trying to tell them during the visit. The parent usually will like their health care provider and will say, oh, yes, everything is fine at home. But then the provider is wondering if the parent is in, saying exactly what is going on at home. And once I started working with community health workers, oh boy, were my eyes opened. And like I said earlier, difficult for the parent to focus during the visit. The parent is not always listening to what the health care provider says. Is it because something else is going on and that's occupying their mind? Lots of things going on. And another difficulty a lot of uh, adults and parents of children with asthma are having is getting difficulty contacting their health care providers through the office channels. And again, that it can be COVID related. There's been lots of changes in office. Office staff aren't up to what they're normally working. So there's a lot of issues going off, going on that can affect the relationship between the provider and family. So why are home and visits so important in asthma care? Number one, it helps the provider to know what is going on in the home. That's the biggest because the home health visitor goes into the house and actually sees what's going on. We had, I had a patient years ago, horrible asthma, poorly controlled, finally hooked them up with a program with community health care workers. Turns out the mother was a hoarder and a child didn't have a bedroom to sleep in and was sleeping on the sofa with pets. The having home visits allows the provider to refer the family to needed resources because the home visitor goes in and sees what the family needs and also develops that relationship with the family where they trust the home visitor so the home visitor can know what actually is going on and what they need. The home visitor community health worker acts as the eyes and ears of the provider and that's so, so important. And it really does make a difference in the care of the child or the adult. The home visitor CHW is the liaison between family and provider. Lots of times home visitors, community health workers can come to the visit with the family, can help contact the healthcare provider for the family and let them know what's going on because the parent can't get through or the adult can't get through. The community health worker or home visitor also gives the family education on asthma to you know and does it at a oh, what's the word i'm looking for does it at a, a pace that the family can understand and can absorb so if you try to give somebody too much information at one time they're not going to take it all in and also helps the family to feel empowered or the adult to feel empowered like hey i finally know what's going on in my life and the other big issue that why these home visits are so important, it has shown, studies have shown a decrease in emergency room visits, hospitalizations for asthma, improved medication compliance, and improved family life. For my clinic that I had a few years ago, we had community health workers go and visit the families. And for one insurance, one Medicaid insurance, we dropped emergency room visits and hospitalizations by 75%. That was over a two year period. Dropped them by 75% 
We improve medication compliance and improve family life for these families. So it does work. So we need to have a partnership with either a community health worker or a public health educator. We as a health care provider, we diagnose, we assess, we prescribe medications for these children and these adults. But we don't have a view into what's really going on into their in their lives other than what they tell us when they're here in the office visit, which sometimes they don't tell us a whole lot. That's where the public health educator or the community health worker comes in because they can reinforce and educate the family on what has been taught. Who are community health workers? They're a trusted member of the community. They're a member of the health team. They know the communities that they serve and they're culturally sensitive, which helps the families to develop trust. Okay, this is Andrea. I'll do this part and Gail, you're fantastic as always. <laughs> so let's uh, talk about how asthma home visit programs work. I'll tell you how my program works. I am um, in Utah, but keep in mind that each agency might do things differently and they might have different funding sources. So well, the where the health educator and community health worker come in is that we're a liaison between families and the healthcare provider. We're really their eyes and ears and we can tell them what really goes on in the home as Gail gave an example about. The family can confide in us and we can really help them problem solve. We know that asthma isn't going to be their first priority if they're worried that their electricity or water is going to be shut off. And if they're short on cash, they're going to spend the money on groceries, not inhalers. We're someone they can trust and we're here to help. We are not here to judge them. We want to listen, help, and empower them to self-manage. Non-compliance can happen because maybe a patient didn't know that their inhaler usually works for 12 hours. So they need to use it in the morning and at night. Maybe they can't afford to refill it, so they're skipping their night dose and just take it in the morning. We know people with asthma are notorious compensators, so they don't really realize how bad their asthma is or can be. So we can help them find copay assistance or coupons for inhalers. We teach them how to make their home allergy and asthma friendly. We can help them find transportation and help with language barriers and make sure that we use a low literacy level if that's needed for different people. So there's 25 CDC funded sites across the US. One of those is in Utah, circled there in red out west here. From the research Gail and I did, we found that all states in the US have some type of asthma program, except for North and South Dakota. So this is an example of Philadelphia's Room to Breathe Asthma Home Visit Program. And as I mentioned, there are some programs that can be funded by other sources. I'll share our program success as a CDC funded site. With our grant, we align services between public health and healthcare sectors to provide comprehensive asthma control services. We know there's more to asthma control than just giving someone an albuterol inhaler. Patients need in-depth asthma management, and they also need home-based trigger reduction. This is Utah's referral flyer for clinics, and I will talk briefly about how our referral system works. So our hospitals, clinics, and we have one insurance provider on board right now. We're doing a pilot project. And we have school nurses who identify patients who have been either in the ED or hospitalized within the last year. Maybe they had oral steroids within the last year or have an asthma control test of 19 or less. Or if they're the little kiddos, if they have a track score of less than 80. And honestly, most of my referrals qualify with a low asthma control test. They think they're doing really well, they're not. So we help anyone with persistent or uncontrolled asthma. For our program, we do not have income requirements. In fact, I have helped people who were homeless and couch surfing. So we met that person at a library, all the way up to someone who lived in a multi-million dollar home. 
and people in between. For our program, there's no age limit. We help kids, teenagers, and adults. I've helped toddlers and all the way up to a 92 year old and everyone in between. So once a patient signs the consent form, either from the school nurse or in the clinic or at the hospital, the referral can either be faxed over to me or sent via encrypted email. If the client competes a program, then I will send feedback with their permission to whomever referred them. So I also include information to follow up on, such as we found black mold in the bathroom, there is a hole in the roof in the kitchen, true story, uh, whatever else happens to be going on with that particular family. So if a referral doesn't respond to my contact attempts or hangs up on me, I include that information in the report back to whoever sent the referral. They will have a list of the times and dates I attempted to contact their patient. We've had referrals say, oh yeah, well they didn't ever call me from the asthma program. Well, then the healthcare provider can pull up my report of the dates and times I called and they can see that they didn't respond to my attempts to contact them. So Utah follows an evidence-based asthma home visit program, which consists of three visits and two follow-up phone calls. So right now, I know that every asthma home visit program is different, but in Utah, we are only offering virtual visits. Our positivity rate for COVID is a whopping 46%. That's 46%. So I won't go into referrals home right now. I also have asthma and I need to be able to protect myself. So instead, I use a HIPAA compliant clinic for virtual visits. Um, that can make it a little bit hard for me to see all the rooms in the home just looking through the computer screen. Also, when I was able to go in person, it was really helpful to be able to do the sniff test because I can identify areas that have mild, mildew or mold. Um, you can smell the pet urine or other things that might be going on in the home. Um, Sometimes the referrals are really nose blind to what their home smells like, but when I can come in and see what's going on, it can help them identify some of those asthma triggers. So hopefully someday we'll be able to do in-person visits again. So visit one is where they learn about asthma symptoms, triggers, medication, and inhaler technique. So we all know how important it is for patients to learn that asthma is a disease of inflammation in their lungs. So what I do is I make lung models with a paper towel tube covered with colored paper to show a normal bronchial. Then to show what it's like to have asthma, I use a pool noodle segment to show the inflammation of the lumen as well as the tightening of the smooth muscles. And then I have really fancy plastic wrap that shows the mucus production. So a lot of my patients seem to be really intimidated by the medical models. So I really scaled back to this and I tell patients if they remember nothing else from my visit to remember that they do not want to be a pool noodle. And they laugh, but it helps them remember and it helps them visualize the swelling in the lungs. And I will do anything, no matter how silly it is to get them to learn. Uh, we do a lot more in visit one. We have probably over three pages of potential asthma triggers. I also teach them how to be able to assess for themselves if their asthma is controlled versus uncontrolled. Uh, most of our clients don't realize that they are using too much albuterol. And we talk to them about how it could really prevent some symptoms if they're using a controller inhaler and to chat with their doctor about that, if that would be a good fit for them. I also talk about the difference between a controller inhaler and a quick relief or rescue inhaler. I let them know that albuterol and some controller meds can be used in a nebulizer. I know there are many opinions about using a nebulizer versus an inhaler, and there's even studies about it, but I know there are times I cannot inhale deep enough to try to use my inhaler. Having a nebulizer in our home over the last 22 years has been a literal lifesaver, and this is a hill that I am willing to die on. We also want clients to know that they have a right to know about different treatment options and they get a say in the decision of how their asthma is treated. We make sure that they have an up-to-date copy of the respiratory treatment poster from Allergy and Asthma Network. 
if they don't like their current controller, if they don't like the dry powder inhaler or their meter dose inhaler, they can see that there is a rainbow of options out there. They just need to go back to their doctor and chat about what would be best for them. And make sure that they also know about spacers and nebulizers and how to clean them. Uh, really, really important and a lot of people aren't getting that. I also assess their inhaler technique and I can tell you out of hundreds of patients, I've had two that had proper inhaler technique. Uh, I don't make them feel bad. I tell them they're in good company. Most people don't use their inhaler correctly and they just need a few little changes and they'll actually get more medicine out of their inhaler. We teach them the common signs and symptoms and we also talk about the emergency symptoms, of course. We want them to know about what would they need to do and where would they go? Would they go to an urgent care clinic or a hospital? Do they know how to get there? What's the best road to take? Is there someone that can watch their other children if they have to make a mad dash to the hospital? I want them to think ahead and plan ahead just in case and not be panicking at 3.30 in the morning when they're having a problem with a family member. We also tell them, let's not be alarmed here, but we just want you to know that there's 10 people that die every day in the US from asthma. So the most important thing here is really learning how to control your asthma. The National Center for Healthy Housing has helpful trainings for environmental assessments. In my county, I assess homes for water leaks, mold, dirty furnace filters, etc. We have another program with a different coordinator in Salt Lake County, and they're lucky enough to have help from the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. Many of you probably know GHHA. Before the second visit, I will email homework so they can discover any potential problems in their home. Rather than me coming in and telling them what to do, I want them to really assess what's going on. Now that I'm doing virtual visits, I still have them do their homework, but they can take photos of the areas that they're concerned about and they can text them to me. Or I've had people use their tablet or their smartphone during the visit to show me problem areas. And you can get a little bit seasick as they're <laughs> moving their smartphone through their home. So for the environmental assessment, I teach them about the most common asthma triggers, where they're found in the home, and what they can do about them. We're not going to go through all of these now. We talk about dust, cockroaches, mice, so much more. We also talk about strong odors, as well as smoke, smoking and vaping. Um, in my office here, I coordinate with our tobacco prevention program, so I can help referrals that want to quit smoking or vaping. And we also have a cessation program for expecting moms and their partners and they get diapers as incentives so we partner with any program that we can to help our clients this is one of the most neglected areas but this is oh so important so not only do we talk about the importance of changing their furnace filter and the MERV rating on their furnace filter but also changing the air filter on their car the cabin air filter so not the air filter on the engine, it's the one that's behind the glove box and it cleans the air that comes into the cabin of the car. So you can see the photo on that top right there. That was a before and after, after Utah got California's wildfire smoke last summer. That's how bad it was here. And I also had a fun trip to the ER because the air quality index was off the charts. So once more, one of those little neglected areas that will really help improve their quality of life is if they can even be in their car and have clean air while they're in their car as well as they're commuting to work. We talk about pets and pet dander and how having a hypoallergenic dog is as common as having a unicorn. Neither of them exist. Uh, we make sure that they understand that dogs and cats have dander and that's what can set off a lot of our allergies and asthma attacks. I will never tell a client to get rid of a pet because they would rather get rid of me and stop getting help from me. So I don't want to shut that down. So we talk about maybe having one safe room where the pet is not allowed. So, you know, what about a bedroom that has nice clean sheets that are washed once a week, that's been vacuumed, that has an air purifier in there. Um, we talk about a lot of different things about how they can still have the pets in their life. We also talk about mold, which can be a big problem for any of you that have had those in their home, had mold and water dish issues which I have in my last two homes, sadly. So before the assessment, I deliver the supplies on their porch and run. 
So remember that 46% positivity rate I told you about here in Utah? Yeah, that's why I don't go inside. So it's DoorDash, but I'm not leaving food or whatever. I'm leaving not exciting things, but helpful things for them. So we deliver the trigger reduction incentives and those are free and they're paid for by grants. I'm often writing grants to try to get more resources for my clients. Now, keep in mind, this is an example of what we do here in Utah. Every program in every state is going to be a little bit different. Um, I actually don't have any funding for air purifiers or vacuums, but Salt Lake County has access to those through the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. But I'm writing another grant to try to get those for my clients. So fingers crossed. So if there's a problem in the house with the environmental assessment, we don't just tell clients, well, yeah, good luck fixing that. We have partnerships with various housing agencies that can help with resources and funding. So most areas of the country have a Habitat for Humanity or a housing authority. So it could be a city housing authority or a county housing authority. Um, another thing you can look for as a resource to help your clients is check with your city to see if they applied for a CDBG funding. So that stands for Community Development Block Grants, and those come through HUD. Some cities use that funding for their critical home repair program and housing rehabilitation program. Oftentimes those are based on income, but those are out there and a great resource. So visit three is just a follow-up to see how they're doing. Oftentimes, since this is about a month after the last visit, we'll see that they needed to change their inhaler, or maybe they had an add-on inhaler, or maybe the doctor changed them from a dry powder to a meter dose inhaler, or maybe their doctor wanted them to start a biologic, or they needed some home repairs done, and that gives them a little bit of time to work on that. So on the last visit, we review their technique again because it's really easy for them to fall back into those old habits of not using their inhaler correctly. And then we make sure that nothing else is missing. And this is also another time when we can follow up on those social determinants of health. Are they able to afford their inhalers? Do they have transportation to the clinics? Is there any food insecurity in the home? Are there any other problems that we can help them with? So we check up with our clients six and 12 months down the road to make sure that they stay controlled. Sometimes, as we all know, someone will have an insurance company that changes what they allow their patients to get for inhalers. Maybe somebody has a job change. Maybe they move. A lot of that can affect their ability to get their inhalers and maintain their asthma control. Maybe they had to switch to a different biologic or they moved to a new house and there's environmental problems in the new house. So lots of moving parts for making sure that long term that they stay well controlled. So Gail mentioned some fantastic outcomes for her program and this is what we've had in Utah. You can see an 80% decline in average missed work days, 51% decline in average missed school days. And as a mom who raised three kids, every time my kids had to miss a school day, I had to miss work. And that really adds up. 41% reduction in average unplanned doctor visits. You can see our 51% reduction in oral corticosteroids, 75% reduction in asthma related ED visits. And we're really excited about this. 87% reduction in hospitalizations, especially during COVID when there's a shortage of beds and these patients may not be seen in a timely manner. So some of the problems that we have come across over the years, um, for me, my county is 2,400 square miles. So it takes a lot of time and mileage for me to provide visits. So many of the homes that I go to, it's a 45 minute one, 45 minute drive one way from my office. And I also run the program by myself, which can be really difficult with a large population, not as large as some other areas. We have about 675,000 people. Obviously, all of them do not qualify for the program, but um, I have a pretty heavy workload. As with every, anything else, there's a lot of last minute cancellations. We also have no shows after I've driven 45 minutes out there to drop off some supplies or when I was doing in-person visits. Sometimes they just want the free cleaning supplies and mattress pad cover and then they just stop answering the phone call. And the virtual clinic, we have had some problems with that if some people don't have a lot of data on their smartphone plan. 
some other things that we've seen is many clients don't have a tablet or a computer. So I'll just mail a printout of the presentation and they can follow along during the virtual call. Sometimes they move, sometimes their phone's disconnected, and quite often they ghost me, which I think that's the title that the youngsters use these days. And, and now I know how my son feels when he calls girls to ask them out. I know what it feels like that people avoid my phone calls. So some other potential barriers that we found is before the pandemic, we would go into a lot of uh, areas that had a high crime rate or violent neighborhoods. Um, still do this when I'm dropping off incentives. And I've actually stopped counting the number of asthma attacks I had after about the 25th or 26th house when I would be in the houses, I would have a lot of asthma attacks. Oftentimes when I would pull up to a house, I could see that the outside of the house would warn me a little bit about what the inside would look like. So I would just have to use my albuterol either before I left my office or if I pulled up in front of the house and knew I would need it, I would premedicate before I go in. I um, also very frequently got sick from families, including one family that didn't tell me they were battling norovirus and I almost ended up at the ER with dehydration. So. Um, lots of challenges, but still dedicated to trying to help all of these patients. So when you're looking at some partnerships, possible partnerships, we found that local schools can be fantastic. I know that the school nurses are really overworked, um, but oftentimes they can refer some of their students to us that they notice that are sort of frequent flyers and missing school quite a bit and in the hospital quite a bit or the ER. We've had great luck with colleges. Those can also be good partnerships. So I've been able to get a lot of public health interns over the years that could help me with my program. State and local asthma pro programs, they have a wealth of information and resources. Uh, lots of webinars, lots of resources. They can help you with what's available in your area. So my county, Utah County, we're actually doing a pilot program right now where we've partnered with one insurance company for referrals. So I got about 20 referrals in January, which is quite a bit for me to go through. Um, and then also Utah has a pilot program with Medicaid where we are getting referrals in all of our rural areas. We have a lot of areas that are very sparsely populated, lots of um, cowboys, lots of cows, lots of horses, lots of really desolate areas, and some of those areas need a little bit extra help. So we're really hoping that both of those pilot programs will continue. So these asthma education foundations also have a wealth of information. So often it's divided up into information for professionals as well as information for your, your patients. No need to reinvent the wheel. You can just take what's already out there if you need information for some of the people that you're working with. So on the environmental side, this can be a lot harder for a lot of people. You just don't know what you don't know. So the National Center for Healthy Housing has some great webinars and trainings. The National Environmental Education Foundation also has some great resources. EPA is also a wonderful resource for, for mold, for radon, for cockroaches, for poor indoor air quality, all sorts of things. If you're lucky enough to have Green and Healthy Homes or GHHI in your area, uh, that can be a great resource and that can be some additional funding that you can partner with for your program. I know in Salt Lake, they're able to do other things such as removing old carpet and installing solid surface flooring. Um, they can help with safety issues and health issues. There's a lot more that they can do than I'm able to do in my county. Health departments. So also when you're having some renters or you're having some homeowners that are having difficulty with their homes, health departments have great environmental health offices, which is where I work, and they have a lot of resources there, and they have licensed inspectors that can help you with various things. It's all going to depend on your county. It's all going to depend on whatever housing codes you have there. So here's some references for some of the things that um, Gail and I have chatted about. And then here's our contact information for Gail and I. Thank you for listening to us. I hope this has helped you see both sides. So her perspective as a provider, my perspective as a home visitor, and how important it is that really you need to partner and, and weave those resources together. It really is a team effort. 
So let us know if you have questions or need ideas for your asthma home visit programs, or if there's others out there listening that are running asthma home visit programs, we'd love to hear about your successes or things that are working in your area. So please feel free to reach out to us. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Andrea and Gail. Uh, this has been so informative, and uh, and I really do think that uh, asthma home visits are just a total key in that whole continuum of care. Uh, we do have quite a few questions, and uh, and I'll pose those to you. You can each just you know uh, bounce in and answer as you'd like to. Someone was asking the question. Can I ask how the child with no bedroom and the mom who is a hoarder, how did you find the resources to meet this need? Was the mom able to get counseling and housing support for more for or more income for better living space or something that improved environmental triggers? Uh, this is Gail. So thanks for the question. So what happened is they were um, part of a program that Philadelphia had back then called Healthy Homes, Healthy Kids. So what they did is they actually went into the home and did a super clean, which means they pretty much cleaned out the house, got rid of all the trash, all whatever was hoarding, cleaned out the child's bedroom. And so he finally did have a place to sleep. There were still some issues. Mom was very against any type of counseling, but he was a frequent flyer in our pulmonary clinic at the time. So we saw him frequently and I talked with her a lot also, but we were able to get him back in his bedroom and get the hoarding situation under control through the uh, program that they were involved with. Wow, that makes a huge difference for a child, doesn't it? Oh yeah. <laughs> the, the next question is, will you share the slides after the presentation? We will have a, a PDF document with the slides on it posted with the webinar recording within about 48 hours. It'll be on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Scroll to the bottom of the, of the homepage and you'll find them there. Okay, our next question. Is there a specific contact for the Bay Area and California? Can you share the referral form we can use? Uh, I'm sure people are curious about how do they find someone somewhere to help them. Can you ladies address that? Yes, I know that California Department of Health does have an asthma program. So that's our state program. So I'm not sure which counties are funded, but they've been very active in asthma education. So I would contact California Department of Health asthma program. Yeah, and I also, I used to um, follow an organization called RAMP. R-A-M-P, and it, I think it was based in the San Francisco area. The other thing um, to do is contact the public health departments and also the, the Medicaid organizations or your Medicaid insurance programs. Lots of times they have programs also for home visiting, especially with asthma. That's great, that's so helpful, thank you. Uh, next, pers next person's asking, how does the in-person versus virtual visits compare in your experience? You know, I'm not a fan of the virtual visits and this has been really difficult for me. I, I really feel like I see a lot more when I'm in the home. I feel like I bond more to the people and they're more um, trusting. And I really don't like the virtual visits. I don't think it's as good as it could be. Um, I'm anxious to get back to at home, but I, I just don't know when that's going to happen. Um, and I don't know that there's a, a better option. Um, sometimes some of our, one of our coordinators that lives in one of the rural areas, when the weather's warm, she'll meet someone in a park and they'll just sit outside and, and do the visit that way. Um, so there's not any risks with COVID. So not as good, but what do you do? We, we can't not help these people um, with what's going on right now. We know this is a critical that they're, um, care continues. Yeah, and the same thing is happening in Philadelphia. They're doing a combination. They're just starting to go back into the homes. But then again, it's dependent on the families if they want somebody to come in the home. Sometimes they'll just meet on the front step. A few years ago, I had a community health worker meet with a parent at a local restaurant. So, you know, you do what you can do. They really, but they also agree with Andrea. They really don't like the virtual home visits. 
Well, it, we've everyone's had to make so many accommodations during uh -huh. this COVID pandemic. And uh, there are so many things that we all go, oh, this is so much, so much less than ideal. But at the same time, we have to keep going where we can. And certainly those ideas you've spoken to uh, relate to that. Uh, the next question is actually one that I can take. It says, uh, the Allergy and Asthma Network did have a telehealth program, but it's at a cost. Just wondering if anyone knows how that went and where or is going. And we do, we have an asthma coach program, uh, a telehealth program, that, uh, but it is at a cost at this time. We're trying very hard to get it covered by insurance, but, uh, but we have uh, telehealth asthma coaches that can um, reach out to people and, uh, and do some home education. Okay, any thoughts on who tenants can contact for mold removal if a landlord does not fix it? Yes, that's a that's a very good question. Um, hopefully, wherever whoever is asking the question and where you live, there is community legal services. Um, and th so the best thing to do is make sure that the tenant documents pictures of the mold, and that they've you know and documented or kept records of reaching out to the landlord for you know requesting you know mold remediation and then contact your community legal services to uh help in that aspect because they they can they're able to tell the uh, tenant exactly what to do that they can do legally to get this landlord to provide um services for them and they can also you know take it further depending where you live Yes, and I get calls about this almost every day, and it can be a little bit tricky. Um, most states have a Fit Housing Act that specifies that the landlord must have a healthy and safe environment. So, you know, getting to the detail of what actually that encompasses. Um, the other problem is some landlords can really retaliate uh, against the renters. Um, they can evict them. They can um, really make their lives miserable. So it's a really tricky road to walk. Mm -hmm. So some health departments actually can go out and send inspectors out to go visit with landlords. We don't have a housing ordinance in our county, sadly, and can't do that, um, but other places can. So really contact your local health department and their environmental health office and see if they can offer some additional help as well. And yes, yes. there's always a, a legal services that can help with uh, bad housing situations. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, next, Amy is asking, can you talk a little more about the National Center for Healthy Housing? Do they offer conferences or classes to help those of us doing asthma-related home visits? Yes, yes, they do. And in fact, I've been through their training, I think, three different times. And it was an all-day-long training. It took two different days. So um, I'm not sure what they're doing right now during the pandemic, if they're doing that virtually. We actually were partnering with one of our local universities here, and then also Green and Healthy Homes covered the cost for the training for us, but it's very in-depth. It goes through checking the rain gutters to make sure the rain gutters aren't leaking and spilling out the water close to the house and that that's not wicking through the foundation. It goes through lead, it goes through radon, it goes through indoor air quality, it goes through a lot of things, very um, intensive. So look up on their website i'm not sure what they've changed to during the pandemic but well worth the time and money to have that training done okay our next question is do you do any school visits as well so what i used to do um, our american lung association is defunct here in utah but what we used to do was open airways where we'd meet with the kids um, so that was to help the kids, but our inspectors actually do go out to schools because they have to inspect their cafeterias, and then they can also address any other problems that are going on at that time. Oh, years ago, Andrea, when I was a school nurse in, in an elementary school, I taught open airways, and I just think the world of that program. It was a lot of fun, but it was also great learning, and it's a great curriculum from American Lung Association. Absolutely. Lisa is also asking, can I get resources for Minnesota? So we already talked about how to find resources in your area, but Lisa, I am aware that um, Minnesota has a great asthma program. So yes. look for that information to contact them. Yeah, th this is Gail. They do have a very good asthma program. And years ago, 
we had found that somebody in Minnesota had put for the state had put together an electronic asthma action plan that we were able to download and use it in our clinic. So they had excellent resources. Great. Here's an interesting question. Have you noticed improved asthma control with masking due to the pandemic? Um, yes, through my community health workers and they're talking with the families because the kids aren't being exposed, especially in the wintertime, aren't being exposed to viruses, which is a big trigger in the wintertime. Um, in terms of masking for the other things, if the kids are outside playing and they have allergies to pollen and that kind of thing, it's not really doing anything. I think the masks are preventing, and it's been documented, you know, preventing cold viruses, RSV, flu last year, all of that was down to like zero, not zero, but, you know, it was very low, the numbers of, of colds and RSV and flu that were being seen. And now they're saying this year it's going to be much worse, but we haven't heard any of that yet. Um, but from the parents of the, the kids that my community health workers were um, seeing, they were saying that, yes, they, you know, weren't getting sick as much, even the emergency rooms and, and the doctors were saying they weren't seeing kids as sick as they had previously. This is Andrea. I echo that. Uh, with four in our family with asthma, my kids previously have been in the hospital 12 different times, ICU twice. So last year was the first year in 22 years that none of us have had pneumonia. We get it every year without fail. And I really feel that masking has protected us from everyone else. We've been germaphobes this whole time. And we also noticed uh, that it did help with our allergies. We all have allergies. All the kids had allergy shots. And so it does help protect us from pollen when we go out. So who knew? Who knew? Okay, our next question is, how many families do you usually service per year? Oh. Do you know, um, this is Andrea, it really varies on how many referrals I get. Um, I can have visits every day of the week. I've done, it really varies. I'm trying to think off the top of my head since I started the program. We've had a few hundred that we've gone through um, and we started visits in 2016. Um, so it really varies. Sometimes I'm just packed and other days I can't get any appointments set up. So it just varies. Gail, what about you? Um. Right now, the, the community health workers that I have are sort of picking up extra families. I know one of my community health workers from the very beginning when the program started about two years ago, she has 200 families oh. that she has seen. Not that she's seeing 200 families now, but they're trying to go for three to four visits a day. So, so maybe about 20 families a week. Yeah, and that's a lot. That's a lot. And then with everything else that they're having to deal with with these families, just multiplies it. We have a listener uh, who is offering the comment, the upside of virtual visits has been that you get access to some families that were not open to home visits due to things like migra immigration status, domestic mm -hmm. violence, et cetera. Do you find yeah. that to be true? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and you have to be very careful when you're on the call. So I will always um, pivot my computer and say, I'm alone in the room, the door's locked, and I will pivot so that they can see that the door's closed, there's no one else in the room with me. And then I'll ask, is there anyone else um, with you today that, that, that wants to join us? Because there will often be people off camera. Um, so that's interesting. So you have to be really careful. I've, I have had domestic violence situations and other situations. So... Um, and it has allowed people in, has let us be able to go in. It can be really touchy wow. sometimes, but if that's the only way we can get in and help someone, we will. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, 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 there are, often are so many other things going on, aren't there? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. And so the next question, I think this will, this will have to be our last question. What do you for, do for families that haven't responded to you? Do you send them literature or any educational information? In, in our program, they have door hangers. So they will put door hangers, you know, on the front door of the address that we have for them. They um, will, if they don't get, if they don't get a, a response the first time, they'll wait another week and they'll call again. They'll usually do like 
two or three phone calls and maybe a couple of texts. And then they'll stop for a while because people don't like to be bugged so much. And they'll wait a few weeks and then they'll try again. And sometimes that works. So for me in Utah, my budget doesn't allow me to be able to mail out um, coloring books and different things to all of the referrals. Um, as I mentioned, I've had just 20 um, within the last month. And so uh, one thing I do make sure is that the clinics are stocked up. So the clinics that I work with, I make sure that they have Dusty the Asthma Goldfish coloring books. Um, I make sure that they have little comic books. I have make sure that there's uh, some really fun comic books um, Dr. Al and the Sneeze and Wheeze Busters. So we take those out on the second visit where the kids learn about the environmental triggers. So anything like that that I have, I leave with the clinics and then they can give those to their clients. Wonderful. Oh, Andrea and Gail, thank you so much for all this information today. We totally appreciate it. And I'd like to thank our listeners for joining us today as we looked at the impact of asthma home visits. Please join us for our next webinar on vaccines and COVID-19, science-based thoughts on the long haul. Uh, that'll be on Thursday, February 17th at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. You can register for this and all of our webinars at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Scroll all the way down to the bottom of the homepage to find our webinar recordings and links for registration. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, this is Sally Schessler for the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. We are here to help you get the education and answers that you need to live well with asthma so we can all breathe better together.